from the New England Air Museum, Flight SimCon 2016 and AirDailyX.net. I am joined by John Venema and Ed Correa of Orbix Simulation Systems. Very busy conference today. We're all a little bit tight in here. Very good turnout. Today we're going to be taking a look at some things that we've been wanting to see for a very long time. But before we get to that, I just want to talk a little bit about Orbix when it started obviously you've come a very long way from just a small company to what i would say is probably the top two publisher of flight simulation products might be wrong you may correct me on that but john just give me a little bit of an idea of how you decided to start orbix and what sort of started to lead you down this path oh uh, well i was learning how to fly um, so really just as a hobby i used uh, flight sim 9 fs9 and the textures I saw in the sim really weren't up to scratch. They didn't relate to the real world, what I saw out the window. So I set about creating some textures for myself, set up a little blog site, and uh, soon enough there was all these hundreds of people saying, this is really great, are you, are you going to share this? I thought, yeah, I'll share it, no problem. So we created this project called uh, Vista Australis, Voz. I remember that. And Voz just, just mushroomed, it just got really big, it was downloaded, three, four, hundred thousand times someone said you should what if you charge a dollar for every time someone downloaded and I said you know what <laughs> there's a business idea light bulb yeah. so I really I, did, I didn't start out to commercialize this but the hobby sort of turned into a business opportunity and then Microsoft um, released the beta for Flight Simulator X and the resolution of all the textures jumped you know by tenfold so we thought Oh, we'll do something great here. So we start off with Australia, a lot of pre-launch publicity and hype around that, a lot of excitement, launched it, and it sold really well. And with that, we are able to get investment into the company, um, get some shareholders on board, and we've just grown there from there. At what point did it become Orbix? We re I registered Orbix as a company back in 2006. So, in fact, we're almost at our 10th anniversary as wow. we're talking today, yeah. It was June 2006 that I registered the company, and it was March 2008 that we released our first product. So we had that two-year uh, R&D period of uh, getting all the tech together and building a team. Who were the first people that you brought in? Matt, and, how, and how did you know them? How did you get uh, Well, I, I had the, the luxury of cherry-picking the top talent from the Voz project. That was a freeware, freeware project. So we started off with Martin Hanair, uh, who's no longer working with the company because his children are growing up and he's got, right. you know, uh, and Matt Tompkins as well. Um, they were they were guys on the on the Voz project, um, and and they worked with me on the first region. Um, since then, we've added nearly 60 people to the team that include full-time staff and volunteers and beta testers, and um, so and we're distributed right around the world now. Now, when Orbix first came across my vision, mm -hmm. I remember it as just this company that's making these really cool small airfields. I know that you had Brisbane and you had Melbourne, and we'll probably get into Melbourne shortly here, but ultimately you decided to go down this path where you had made this region of Australia and you were gonna populate it with these small airfields. We've gone a long way since then and you have quite literally taken over the virtual world. Tell us a little bit about that path and what sort of led you down to getting to where you are today and all of these products that you now have, which essentially accomplish aircraft, a compass scenery, and of course, all of these terrain add-ons put together. How did you get this far? Well, starting with Australia, that was our own backyard. So we knew what we were doing. Uh, we knew what we wanted to achieve. And we were trying a lot of new technology, you know, 3D lighting systems, um, using, creating accurate terrain, combining mesh and all the elements to make a region. And then we thought, well, where would you go next? And the logical place was to go to where the flight sim audience was. So which is the most popular flight sim audience in the world? USA. What's the nicest part of the USA to fly in? Don't Pacific say, North, I, no, don't I, say I, Southern California. No, so say, I, was, I know. It actually isn't. I would not agree with that. But certainly, uh, yeah, Pacific, Pacific Northwest. Northwest. That was, so that was a no-brainer. Holger came on board. I met him at the, uh, the conference organized by Microsoft and, uh, and uh, AppSim back in 2007 in Bellevue, in Washington. Met Holger. He came on board. That's and a I, marriage made in heaven there. It was. And yeah. He's such a great guy. He was supposed to be here. I know, and I'm, my well, heart is broken that he's not here. Due to governmental visa issues and stuff. Anyway, he's really disappointed. He'll try to make it next year. But Holly and I got together, and um, I said, let's do Pacific Northwest. And so we spent 18 months 
more new technology in there. And as we started making the region, more developers came on board and said, well, let's make some detailed airports. What if you could go Darrington to Concrete to, right. you know, uh, Anacortes, I just, so, and, so the and, actual yeah. thought wasn't to build the region to fill it with airports. The point was just building this region. Yeah, that's it. Ah. And the airports came along because we had the, the regions team is a very different uh, discipline and focus to an airport developer. An airport developer focuses primarily what's inside the fence and maybe a bit of photo reel around it, whereas a region sinking in hundreds of thousands of square miles, you know. So that sort of just blended. Pacific Northwest came out and we started releasing these airports that sat on top of Pacific Northwest and they're incredibly popular. Uh, and people found that they wanted to leave this high definition airport like Darrington, go over Pacific Northwest, see that terrain and then land at another high definition airport. So they're never leaving that really highly detailed virtual world. So that's what we're trying to create is um, the ability just to have that, that sense of immersion from the time you take off and to the time you land to a different destination. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, we talked a little bit about what you guys put into researching new things. Give us an idea in terms of the capital that went into, the, the investment that went into research because Orbix has essentially created a lot of new technologies that other developers are just now starting to kind of get on board with like people flow. Yeah. In the beginning, a lot of people were probably saying, I don't need to see people in a swimming pool or cooking a barbecue, I'm here to fly. Yeah. But now, people look for these sort of sorts of things when they fly now. What type of investment and time went into just developing all these little things? Everything from people flow and object flows to the actual FTX technology. Um, it's measured in millions of dollars. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wow. So in terms of R&D, um, at the start we got R&D grants from the Australian government because we were a tech startup wow. and the government was really pro tech startup. So uh, we got we had some very generous grants from the, from the government. They weren't grants. We basically deferred paying tax for a number of years mm. while we were building our technology. But in terms of what we've spent on all the flows and the tech and you, it's millions of dollars. Wow. Yeah. So Orbix is essentially a million dollar company. Wow. In terms could of, we say that? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, our, our revenues are measured in millions. Yes, correct. We can say that. But we have spent many millions building our technology. Yeah. What is your most popular product right now? Uh, without question, it's FTX Global. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And you've also gotten a little bit with Dovetail as well, and they have implemented that in their flight school recently. How is that coming along? Yeah, well, they released Flight School several weeks ago. From all accounts, it's getting um, downloaded and um, bought quite well on Steam. There's a big community around that. We're very excited about the full sim that's also using FTX Global. Uh, we d we've done a license deal with Dovetail. We're very excited about it. For us, it's a it's a win-win situation. Uh, we're setting up Orbix as a standard for a new generation of flight sim. Our products can sit straight on top of that. Wow. The textures look the same, the palette is the same, um, and more and more airport third-party airport developers are matching their their um, palette and color and textures to our stuff. So we thought it was a really great way to to get the Orbix name out there. I mean, they're releasing a box version of that in Europe, and there's a Orbix logo next to Dovetail's logo, the same size. So for us, that's right. Great marketing. And and it's a great partnership. We're very happy with it. Now, given the current level of success that Orbix is now, is the company where you want it to be, or is there another goal up there somewhere that you're still trying to achieve, that you're still climbing for? I'm always, I'm always trying to achieve goals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next goal is for Orbix to be a 50, valued at $50 million and, and, and be a 50 million company. To do that, we have to enter the commercial space. Uh, partnerships with Lockheed Martin are very, very important to that. Um, we need to really get more sophisticated in terms of setting up a sales team and chasing many more commercial projects. There's a lot of business we walk away from because we're really we're still very much a virtual small startup right. company, and we need to, we're, we're changing our infrastructure and mentality to try to be, grow up a little bit. Um, which is not to say the revenues aren't healthy; they, they are, but we can go to the next level. Uh, we want to complete the vision that we started with FTX Global and Vector and Open Land Class and do the whole world at that detail. We then want to do things with wrapping that product up, set up as perhaps another turnkey product bundle or look at different platforms around that as well. Lots of stuff. I'm, I've, we've got about 27 projects in development right now. Wow. Just for the rest of this year and into next year. Um, so we're, you know, we, what do we typically do a year? We release about 
40 products a year now. Yeah, so. yeah. All right, let's shift gears here a little bit. Yes, it is time. <laughs> Ed. Yes. Everyone knows your name. We they see do. you all the time. We know that you are an, a scenery developer. You have put out um, Carlos. Carlos, help me out. I'm sorry. San Carlos. San Carlos. Thank you very much. Um, so, and I didn't know that you were a developer because you had released things before in the past as well. You, remind me what else you've released for Orbix. Uh, for um, Orbix, I've done Wollongong, Australian Airport. And then prior to that, it was mainly just uh, freeway stuff with the Aussie X guys. So, yeah. So, we know that you're important. And whenever Alex, he's running around somewhere, or Misha, or Jared Marshall, who we wish could be here next year, Jared. Um, whenever they release something new, everyone gets on their knees and they just, oh my God, we love you. But obviously what you do is just as equally as important as what the developers do. And that's one of the things that I've always wanted to do is, what does Ed, what is he doing behind that curtain there? Because what you do is obviously technical, and you might sell yourself short, but what you do is very important. So for those who don't fully know what it is that Ed does, yeah. Tell us, what does Ed do? What does Ed do? Well, um, essentially, basically, just a guy for the operations. Um, obviously, with all the developers, they'll be sending me through their files and all the work, you know, at various stages for, uh, for me to pass on to the testers. So, essentially, I just sort of prepare that for our testers, you know, provide the testers with the, the links to our files, testing notes, make sure they do their testing, and then basically sort of go through the, that stages until we go to the final release stage do the final checks with the testers again, and then I go to Flight Sim Store, work with Adrian, making sure we get the, um, the uh, product released, provide Adrian with you know, the various screenshots, you know, all the blurbs that we have for his website. It's pretty much that, and it's just basically facilitating that process from the, the, the testing stages to the final release, and so just making sure that everybody's yeah, doing their job, basically. Walk me through all these quad installers, because I know that must be a nightmare for you guys right now. Of course, we all want a platform that's constantly evolving and kind yeah. of keeping up with the year that we're living in, but how is that impacting your operation? It's a Having to it. <laughs> it's, it's a nightmare. Well, we're almost done. There's only about four left anyway, so. Um, when, we, when I was starting to four, do it. I'm sorry, four left before prepare 2.4 and then you've got to start all over from scratch. Is that, I'm sorry. I, didn't think, I know, his blood pressure just went up. No, no. no. Um, so basically, um, when I started to do it, you know, I was actually putting out the quad installer, getting the guys to test it. But essentially we were finding that pretty much whatever was working in prepare three was working in prepare two. So basically we decided, well look, just to speed things up, we're not going to bother with testing. So essentially built the installers, I did my first checks, basic checks with it, make sure everything was working fine, then just sent it through to flight some store for him to release, just so we can get it moving quickly. And how so, much time does it take with each update to put in for each scenery? So for those who are complaining, you know, when is this particular product finally going to get the prepared V point whatever update? Take us through the process of one product of just getting it updated and getting it ready. For I'd say probably a whole day. I mean, basically, it's. it's I mean, normally I allow myself four hours type of thing, but essentially to get it from start, to, I need to get the actual original source files. If it's a real older product that we haven't done for a while, you know, make sure I've got all those source files, make sure that's all patched up to date. Um, just whip it through a, the installer. I mean, I allow myself a whole day to do it, basically. I mean, the, and obviously uploading it to flights and store and things like that. So it's, it's, it's not a simple task of just putting it all together, compiling right. and sending it off. I mean, obviously once I've done it, I load it into the Sims to make sure it all works. So, I mean, it's it's a fair bit of you know checking. And I there. imagine the developers, there's a lot of work that they have to do on their end as well in order to yeah, get these yeah, things ready. Yeah, also, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's stuff that needs to be done to actually make sure it works. So I go back to the developer and say, look, this is not working. Can we have a look at it and see why? And basically, that hasn't happened too often. But I mean, I know with Jared, with a lot of his stuff, you know, he likes to have a final check. He likes to it. go for the complex stuff, doesn't he? Yeah. So, yeah. well, I mean, Jared's a great guy. I mean, he's yeah. he's, he's, he's yeah. yeah he's, so he's. he's <laughs> Perfectionist, he's a machine. He's a machine. He's a machine. He's he is machine. definitely a machine. Yeah. Now, the reason why I bring all this up is because you recently mentioned that in the future, it looks like we're going to have to start paying for these upgrades. And what's important is that everyone kind of has that understanding of everything that's going into this so that people can understand, okay, why are we paying to, you know, just for a simple upgrade? I want to kind of get into everything that's going on behind the scenes, the amount of time, the amount of work that's going into it. Just kind of break that down a little bit for us so that those who probably didn't catch the announcement understand why this process is going to happen. Okay, so at the moment we've got, we got prepared 3.3 out. It's broken a few things. 
What's it? What's it broken in? It's a, some. Oh, that, you grab you used a hot fix yeah. recently yeah. too, yeah. Yeah. and then a hot fix in that. So you got that tension every time. That yeah. we actually like Lockheed doing this because the platform's moving forward. It's fresh. It's continually being invested in. So that's a good problem to have. Um, so that's some point release. We don't mind making sure our stuff works for a point release and maybe a few patches here and there for some airports where things break. That's not a problem for us. The major releases, so prepared 4.0, we don't know what's in that. Right. We don't know if it's 64 bit, we don't know what, what breaks, what's new, we don't know if the autogens, we don't know. And moving from two to three is cost us in excess of $100,000. Wow. Which we have given to our community at no cost. We've not asked wow. them one cent for that, but I've got to hire developers that to port existing um, airports, check compatibility to recompile stuff, polygons, autogens, stuff like that, breaks. So that costs money. Right. So we don't know, I had a discussion, said, said, you know, at some point we've got to draw a line in the sand and just charge a nominal fee if there's a major 4.0 and 5.0 Charge, charge a normal fee. Now, the overwhelming feedback we got from customers was, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, and it seems, it certainly yeah. seems fair enough. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a look at some products. Here we go. Let's do it. Big. Okay. Yeah. There's no rudder pedals, but I can, I guess I can give it a shot. You've, you've, you've got twist. We've got a little twist. Here. Twist. Okay. And then just throttle. All right. Let's, yeah. let's do it. So this is Narvik. This is what I've been bugging sore. <laughs> when is this thing going to get out? And I've just been dying to see this. And everything that I've heard just from the rest of the team is everyone is just praising this, saying it's the most wonderful thing that they've ever seen. I guess, John, while I try to take off here, why don't you give us a little bit of insight in terms of what's been done here? Like I've been told, for example, the entire city is actually a 3D model. And yeah, the entire city. Is, what you're looking at, these rocks, uh, is a technique called photogrammetry. Um, and photogrammetry is taking hundreds and hundreds of photos and stitching them together to this insanely sized texture that Tor has painstakingly been there and taken these photos and, and that's why you are seeing such depth in the textures. I think you're oh, in slow mode. mode. I was you're like, what's going on there? Okay. Let's get back over here to the rocks. Um, the, and is it the Waikiki? Yeah, the Waikiki. There we go. There we go. That's there it. There we go. Now, now what's that? Okay. Okay. So the whole, the whole airport and city here was one 3D model. Um, Tor was inspired by Russ White's Ketchikan in Alaska, which uses a similar technique. And he set out to um, learn from that and improve on that. We think he's definitely cracked it with this. Oh, wow. Those rocks are the most realistic thing I think I've ever seen in Flight Simulator. That is incredible. What you should do, John yeah. Gray, if you go follow the coastline, Go over this ridge down to the coast. Follow the coast down this way. The, yeah. Follow the coast line all the way down to the left, and you'll see some container ships, and you'll come across the city, which is just amazing. To do I turn left here at the end of the threshold, or yep. go all the way down this way? No, no. Uh, left at the threshold, it. you'll see these ships and the, and the port. Oh, it's a little weird. I, I it's been so, so so such a long time since I've used a twist rudder. So everything you're looking at oh right now gosh. is one 3D model. Um, we're running this in 4K, on a 4K monitor, all sliders maxed out, and it's just smooth oh as Oh my silk. gosh, smooth this is smooth as silk. Yeah. And by the way, I should mention this is a Jetline system. <laughs> <laughs> Today's program is brought to you by Jetline system. <laughs> Look how smooth this is. And are, is everything maxed out here graphics wise? This is yeah, it is. Every, all everything. sliders yep. are right, I believe, except I think we pulled shadows back a little bit. Wow, this is incredibly smooth. Yeah. If you swing yourself 360 around now, okay. oh sorry, 180, go back towards the city, that's, there's some really Oops. cool models back in the city. Keep coming wow. around. Keep coming around. Yeah. Now you go over the city. Is it straight ahead or go no, no, back around to the mountain? A little bit further to the right. All right. So there, yep, there we go. There's the city. Just fly over that, and in the distance you can see that suspension bridge that he's modeled. Oh my gosh. Now that suspension bridge, funnily enough, has made Narvik Airport redundant. <laughs> <laughs> really? When the bridge opens in a few months, the airport's actually going to shut. Oh, so that's right. You have to release it before that. the airport is, while the airport's still in operation. <laughs> <laughs> it has a little long. Do you hear that tour? 
No, we're not doing any tour jokes about this. No. <laughs> what he's produced here is, I think. No, I mean this is this is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. This is one of the most amazing, and this is all a 3D object. Yeah. That means that each house he had to place, he had to elevate yeah. in order to properly sit on the terrain. Each tree, I, I don't know how we did that. Because I believe there's ways where you guys can just get the autogen to somewhat populate in certain areas or something like that automatically. I'm not sure how that works. And then there are cases where everything has to be manually hand placed. But in this case, he's had to place everything on top of this object. Do we know if the whole thing is hardened or is it just really the airport area? Airport's hardened. So excuse me, the airport's hardened. Uh, he's still in the process of being hardened for the right. You can't see any traffic right now. Yeah, this, is, this is an early beat that you're looking at. Uh, he's now fixed that. We've now got traffic going over the bridge, through the tunnel, into the township, around the, the, the harbour and that. Um, but he had to harden every part of the model to do that. It was quite an you know, intensive bit of work to do that. So. I see you guys have installed the real shader. How are you guys liking that? It looks quite good, doesn't it? I like the way it fades into the distance. I love that. Um, it's not so abrupt. Um, I think the colours look a bit richer than normal. I don't see any performance impact as well, which is quite cool. Well, seeing as I finally got my hands on this, I think probably the ideal thing to do would be to just go ahead and stop any further Flight Sim Con videos. I think I'm just going to stay here and just play. <laughs> yeah. This is one of those scenarios where you, you can just spend hours just... I mean, you can go up to the top of that mountain range. Don't do it now, but there's, a, there's lakes up there that are watermarked. You can land on the lake, look down over the township. It's just incredible scenery. And this is using FTX Norway. It's completely blended in. Yes, I can see that. It's very seamless. The photo or the PR is just incredible. That's yeah, good story. Wow. And the other great thing about this is the night lighting as well. Some of the night lighting images that I've seen is the best I think I've ever seen thus far. My big thing for Tor, if he was here, is what I would ask him, and maybe you guys can answer the question in his stead, is this the first project that he's done? Because I, I don't know of anything else that he's done before. He, actually, he, lives, he lives in a city called Bodo. I know about Bodo. And he actually we, started we that, that project next. about four or five years ago as a personal project. And he's actually, he's quite some way into developing that. That was the first thing he did. But when, when I contacted him uh, some years back, he, he started on this as well. So this is his first project that, that he's worked through to completion. Um, so this, I can't believe how smooth this is. Right, so this this will essentially be his first release. That you're correct. And as a first scenery release, I just can't, I can't believe how beautiful this is. I mean, this is, this is extraordinary talent. And I guess the other question I'd ask him is, is, you know, what is his background in development and design to get to this level of detail for a first scenery release? This is just incredible. Now, naturally, obviously, he's probably hit, you know, bumps along the road because <laughs> it's been in development for quite some time. But um, I guess you learn quite a bit as oh, you yeah. go through the development oh, yeah. process. And, he's, and he has learned a bunch from the team as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, since joining up, you know, he has got regular conversations with a lot of the guys in the team. They share ideas and techniques, and he's learned a lot since joining our team. And we, you know, we're obviously impressed with the stuff that he's devised here for this airport. So it's a two-way street. I love. Look at that the runway approach lighting. This is fantastic. Well, I will say this: regardless of how much longer it takes, it's going to be so much well worth the wait. I mean, this is just incredible. It's extremely smooth. All the textures. I'm almost doing a review, and this is not even. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I'm going to go ahead and put the helicopter down here. Yeah. Um, now, do you guys have anything else you'd like to show off? Uh, we can show you Melbourne International Version Three um, Early Beta. Yeah. Yep. You want to see that? Let's yeah, take it. a look. Let's yeah. put this down here if I can without crashing. What about you? You want to drive that, Ed? Just we're in slew mode. We're going to yeah. flight safe. Just pull it up and. There she is. So swap seats. Nice. All right. And now this is uh, Turbulent Designs who's, who's enhancing this. Yeah. And uh, the guys from Turbulent have come quite a long way as well. They started off uh, doing a few uh, airships from, uh, for Orbix and now it seems like they're starting to get into some bigger projects. They are indeed. They're, they're, they're some of the most talented developers that I know. Um, Russ White joined the team. I know. Incredible. That's a major coup. Yeah. He's such a great, such a, a, um, a talent, that guy. Uh, Greg and Russ and James, great guys, great texture work. Their texture work's fantastic. So we're really happy with the products they've made for us under contract. Um, I'm encouraging them to start publishing in their own right. I really want them to, to set up. Uh, yeah, they definitely and, and have the be, talent. Be turbulent, as turbulent, not just under the shadow of Orbix. You know? They've got the talent to do that. And, right. I, and I meet with these guys almost weekly. 
Um, and that's amazing that you're encouraging them to do that because you know, in your shoes, I'd be like, you know what, just develop for me. But that's incredible that you're encouraging them to, to kind of branch out on their own as well. I mean, whatever they do, I can tell you though that um, the talent is just is, is remarkable and it's increasing with every product that they release. All right, if you want to slow down to the, what you're looking at here is Melbourne International with, ta-da, a ground poly. And it's the mother of all ground polys, just beautifully detailed. Wow, look at that. Uh, no more blurry textures. It's right up, bang up to date with uh, what's actually there. You can see in the distance there, if you move, we've got the brand new control tower. Is this is this new fresh PR here? No, it's, oh, that's it, pretty crisp. Yeah, it is, yeah. So it's a brand new control tower that's in there. There's a funny story. The old tower was going to be demolished, but it's classified by the National Trust. You can't, they couldn't take it oh, down. Oh, wow. <laughs> So, so it stays. So it stays. So new and old tower in the same place. What else have we got? We've got the new Terminal 4, Ed. Yep. Terminal 4's there. Oh, they've already completed it. Yeah, Terminal 4's complete. Wow, they move fast. So as you can see, we're still in quite fast. Right. Got beautiful ground poly. Everything stays crisp. This is the main thing that people want to see with this airport. Um, was well, just a really comprehensive, a crisp, clear ground poly. And, and we finally achieved that. Um, the bullies at Turbulent have done a fantastic job with that. No kidding. That is absolutely fantastic. So this is, you know, we're still, this is, uh, we're not in beating with this yet. There's still a bunch of stuff to do. There's autogen to be completed. They still have to do the transit area behind T4. There's a new transit hub and a multi-car garage. And have you worked out how the upgrade process is going to work for the current owners of the scenery? Yeah, it's a, uh, for the first, um, I believe, 30 days, we're offering a, this at 999 upgrade for anybody who's oh, got wow. any previous version of it. Um, yeah, they'll snap that up quickly, probably in the first day and crash the server sure. at flights and store. Uh, YMML <laughs> is our best-selling airport ever in the history of the company. We've sold wow. crazy numbers of this airport. And I think it's because it's 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 one of these iconic bits and pieces airport that has evolved over, you know, um, I think it's nearly 40 years old now, uh, we're over, and uh, so yeah, it's, it's got a lot of character to it. Wow, it's those ground fun. textures are crispy. Those runway textures. Are these new runway textures here? No, nope, that's that's, that's still the that's still uh, Russ and wow. Air's work, runway work. So what they're really doing is integrating. Uh, the existing poly that was there for the runway yeah uh, with brand new ground poly for, for all the aprons very lovely uh, so you can see here now it's slewing at speed everything stays crisp it does it's you know, not changing is, at all is, it's like a, a whole new um, yeah oh yeah you can see this yeah, yeah. in the background <laughs> so we're pretty excited about that so that we, we that should be out within a month um, you know, we'll, we'll spend some time doing a lot of testing. There's a lot of performance improvements to it, obviously, because uh, Russ Lynn has been reworking a lot of the models that are there. Right. Uh, so um, it's come together beautifully. Because that, that'll be the first question people will have is, is how, how has the code itself been adjusted to yeah. run easier on their systems? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of work being done. So really cool. pleased with that. Now, what, what else we can show you is FTX Germany North. Let's take a look at that, yep. because I think there may be one or two fans in Germany that like flight simulation. You think? Uh, there might be one or two, <laughs> and I think they're both here. Over the city of Munster, uh, what you're going to look out here is a very early beta, right? So there's going to be warts in this. Um, we're looking at probably a two-month release window before this is out. So, um, But it's the city of Munster. You're looking at this is entirely constructed out of land class. Um, and Autogen, this is not looking at any photo reel. Wow. Uh, yeah, a whole new set of textures that depict German agriculture, uh, wetlands. Um, there's a whole bunch of new tech that for the first time in regions where we have. Uh, so, yeah, here we go. Now, ultimately, does this will this be basically the level that we'll expect in every German city, or are some cities a little bit more enhanced than others? Um, you, you, you can expect this for the entire country, the yeah, entire country. in two halves. So if, um, Germany North first and then Germany South um, after that. So if you get some elevation, um, just whack F4 a bit. Okay, yeah, now just going to flight mode from here. You can see here, so Look what at you're that. looking at here, you're looking at, this is entirely land class. So the level of annotation of those buildings is just something to behold. It's beautiful work. Um, you're seeing brand new agricultural textures. You're seeing forests depicted exactly as they are, all the waterways. Um, all the 
all the coastal areas in the north of Germany have got uh, sandbars and mud flats in the text in the water textures itself. So with P3D, you could do submarine type of um, see the ocean floor depictor. You know, and my biggest question when it comes to FTX and uh, how on earth do you guys get all of this data? to populate entire countries. I mean, how does that work for all the roads to be in the right place, all the waters in the right place, uh, farmland, cities, trees, even on here you can see, because you said there was no photo reel, right? No. But you can still see here the way all the buildings are, or the way they're all lined up. I mean, how do you get all that data and then recreate it virtually? Like, how does that even happen? That's always been something of a mystery to me. I mean, when it comes to, like, for example, like an airport scenery, like we'll take Misha's current project, we already know there's going to be photo reel. he's going to hand place all of his autogen, that's going to be a small area, but this is, this is an entire country. Yeah, well, um, the quick answer is it's a lot of work. <laughs> uh, this, this region, it's been since uh, Sasha Norma came on board to, be, to lead the project, uh, from Leipzig, you know Sasha's yes, work. Yes, I do. Um, it's been nearly 18 months. Oh, wow. Yes. I didn't actually know you brought him on board. That's that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's, he's project lead for this and Germany South. Uh, he's also worked with us on um, um, FTX England, Scotland, Wales. I see. Sort of so he's, he's, he's uh, got a lot of experience doing all this, um, processing a lot of this vector type of data. Now, what, what Holger and Sasha are good at is taking this geographical information, sourcing it from the right government agencies, getting all the permissions to use it, reprocessing, building the elevation mesh, doing all this finessing of water bodies and roadways. And uh, what we're seeing now in, in, in Germany is that there, there, are, there are hundreds of thousands of roads with trees lining the roads as right. they actually are in the real world. Because wow. we've got new data about trees. So we're, wow. we're showing roads that have... How does it line. note? I mean, is it? do they have to write a code for that to happen? It's just Because they're not... They're, are, they, are they literally no, no, hand-placing? No, 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 no. They're, they're processors and they're using common GIS tools. Wow. Um, that, that, that particular... Um, it's sort of like... It's sort of community within a community. Guys that have got GIS skills um, really have to know their stuff well and, and, and use the right tool set to process the data and then compile using your broken SDK. So it's labor intensive. The quick answer to your question is labor intensive. You know, it's a lot of work. So um, now I'm going to ask a question no developer ever wants to be asked, but <laughs> what are we looking at timeline wise? Uh, we're looking, I want this out in July. So we're, we're looking July release. Wow. So anytime within the next 30 days, really, or, or actually a little bit more. Yeah. End of July ish. End of July yeah. ish. So that, that's that's what we're aiming for. And how long has this been in development? I remember on the top of my head when the original vote went out, but I think that was probably it's been what, 17 months. It'll be 19 17 months. months by the time we release it. Germany South is going to be a lot quicker and more efficient because a lot of the groundwork's already been done. Already done. We have those textures that are specific to the country are already there. Um, so you know, Germany South is going to take 18 months. It'll be a lot to process. Well, this is incredible. Obviously, John having that idea in your head all those years ago that you just wanted something a little better it seems like it's paid off on a grand scale for this flight simulation community we hope so we hope so we have a lot of fun making it um, we're always constantly trying to push uh, the uh, get new tech in there try new techniques so you know there's an example of a region that's there's a lot of stuff in there that's never been seen before people are going to love it the, the level of detail down to you know, polygon land class, and uh, you know, you can see individual bits of forest. Right. Are actually like that in their real world place, right? So you're, wow. you're seeing. So Sasha's gone to an awful lot of trouble to to uh, put forests in where they actually are in real life. So and seeing this in 4K is just amazing. It is. It is. This is incredible. These jet line systems. <laughs> Brought to you by July. <laughs> yes. I want. I want to. I want to take one home. You would take one of these home. It's yeah, brilliant. I want to take one of these home. Absolutely I think this brilliant. is like this is great. This is incredible. Well, John, Ed, anything else you'd like to show us? Anything else you'd like to? Uh, I think there's probably a reveal we can do tomorrow, but let's save it for tomorrow. Yeah, it's pretty exciting news coming up. All right. Okay. So it looks like we will be back tomorrow for another reveal. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for letting me play with that Narvik. You <laughs> shut me up for a while. I can, I can, yeah, I've got, I've got it out of my system. So this was great. Thank you so much. You guys are obviously doing wonderful things, and we look forward to everything to come in the future. Thanks, Andre. It was great. Thanks. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. All right.